octagonal disphenoid, a particular form of the space building polyhedron, one of seven polyhedral shapes which fill space by reflection in such a way that no matter what kind of unsymmetrical garbage you put inside the cell, if you reflect it ad infinitum, you always come back to the home cell with the garbage in the same orientation. You know, better look next time. So we've got two threads, which are two of the three transverse symmetry axes, or two-fold axes, stuck in this cell to hang the soap film on. That's a curved boundary of a sliver of Schwartz's diamond surface, a very stable, physically stable piece of soap film, and I'm going to push it over the corner, and it grows one more edge. It broke, but we'll get it again quickly. So we're, we're going from one surface of genus 3 to its complement of genus 19. Now there is the module that has four edges, two straight edges and two curves, instead of two straight edges and one curve, as was the case for Schwartz's diamond surface. Here we have the genus 19 complement of the surface of genus 3. I'm just using a solution of water, in fact distilled water, and detergent and glycerin. It's not behaving too well, but so we can't win them all. There we are, genus 19 with four boundary curves, two of them straight, and the next three are all going to have five boundary curves, three curved and two straight. That looks good. Well, I lost it. But you saw the idea. The point was that by starting off with genus 3, going to genus, there's genus 3, going to genus 19, we sprout an extra edge, and then we can either knock down this corner, that one, or that one by two different kinds of operations to make an even more Baroque piece of curved soap film. And we can actually calculate the genus of the eventual fundamental region by just taking an inventory of how many corners or vertices these films have, and then counting up all the angles and the interior angles in those corners, four corners here, 
and then plugging them into a very simple formula known as the Gauss-Bonnet formula, and seeing by how much these angles fail to add up to the total which would be proper for a plain polygon having the same number of uh, corners. And that tells us about the degree of saddleness or Gaussian curvature of the surface. Now, I'll put this one away. I have here another kaleidoscopic cell, which is one-fourth of that cell that we were just using, the tetragonal disphenoid. This thing has the jawbreaker of a name called by Coxeter, the quadrirectangular tetrahedron. Anyway, it's a funny little tetrahedron with one symmetry axis, which is probably not visible in the camera, or maybe it is, but it's a single nylon thread yes. joining my fingertips. It's a two-fold axis, because if you turn this around 180 degrees, you see it's right back where oh, it started, beautiful. except for that hole, which is just an axis hole for the straw. Now, I'm going to blow Schwartz's primitive surface instead of the diamond surface in here. And um, soap film is soap solution is not behaving very well today, but some days that's the way it goes. Okay. Maybe that the atmosphere is too dry today. That's very likely a factor. That's very likely. But we'll yeah. succeed now. Wow. That's a piece, a slightly defective piece. Oh. Uh, that was a very beautiful surface we were passing through. I'm going to show you that one in a minute. You all oohed and odd at just the right place. That's really the object of this. And I was intending to surprise you with that one. Now, there's a piece of Schwartz's primitive surface. A little hard to see. It would be better if I had a cell without this scotch tape on the outside. But I don't happen to at the moment. If you look inside that hole, you can see a little sliver in the form of a curvilinear triangle, one straight edge and two curved edges of Schwartz's primitive surface. Now I'm going to transform that very easily into Schwartz's, into the surface of Schwartz's pupil, Naobius. And by the gauss bonnet inventory, among other methods, that's the principal method, you can determine that that an assembly of 48 of those makes a fundamental region of genus 9. So we went from genus 3 to genus 9, and they're back to 3 again, up to 9. Now by whipping this around into what you all anticipated a minute ago, I'm going to, if I can remember how, produce that surface of genus, I don't remember what, it's 20 something as I recall. Um, and if we can do that, I'll be very satisfied. It's a nice looking surface. It has one straight edge and three curved ones. How do we do that? I think we start off here. There it is. Naobia's surface, a 
the stationary state of the soap film is also in stable equilibrium. By increasing the area, when you perturb it, you introduce restoring forces because of the surface tension property of soap films, which makes them want to reduce their area. Now that other surface I showed you, let's see if we can do it once more quickly, even though I know it's difficult with so few preparations to uh, show it to a camera in a way that makes it very easily visible. This other surface doesn't have this property. You noticed I had to blow on it constantly, or intermittently at least, first from one side and then the other. The point is, you see, we'll let it go now. The point is that that surface is actually a surface of maximum area with respect to these free plane boundaries in the sense that by collapsing a little to one side or the other, it can actually become a surface of somewhat less area. That's exactly the opposite situation from what we saw with the Schwartz primitive surface module and the Naobian surface module. There, the surface sprang back and we could let it sit there until hell froze over as long as we prevented the surface from draining too much, which we could do by taking it up in a space shuttle, and as long as we prevented it so, so we could eliminate gravity, as long as we prevented it from evaporating, which we could do by sealing it suitably in the proper atmosphere. So. This subject is uh, fraught with complexity, investigating differential geometry and topology uh, by means of soap films. One can do very simple experiments with a certain degree of reliability and confidence. There are some pitfalls to be watched out for in the sense that some things which are apparently true that one can make soap film demonstrations of are not actually true. And before I close, I just want to mention briefly what one of those effects is. You notice that this cell 
is almost as big as my hand or more, that uh, this cell here, which I'll hold up, uh, is smaller, contains a, a, a clear vinyl plastic model of a different soap film, which is in a stationary state, also in unstable equilibrium, not being provided with any thread or nylon filament to hang up on is uh, one of the major reasons why it is the surface of maximum area or one in unstable equilibrium. Uh, this, the reason for choosing this cell in this large size is that the boundary of a surface increases less rapidly as you scale up the size of the surface but still keep the proportions, is still keeping the proportions the same. The boundary doesn't increase as fast as the area. The boundary is a one-dimensional object or entity, and the area is a two-dimensional object or a mathematical entity. And ideally, we don't want any physical energy, potential energy associated with the boundary, because it will distort the mathematically ideal shape of the surface. So by making the cell rather large when one is experimenting with actual soap films, one comes closer to a physical realization of the ideal mathematical requirement, which is that the area of the film uh, be the place where all the energy is tied up and not the boundary. And there are effects which I haven't time to discuss, anomalies which are misleading and have nothing to do with the ideal mathematical behavior of true minimal surfaces that arise if you don't pay due, due account, take this duly into account and work with cells that are too small. Here is a model, I hope can be seen by the camera, of a surface lying very near to Schwartz's diamond surface, but there's a little pressure difference. There's a little less air pressure down below than up above. So this is a surface of constant mean curvature, like a minimal surface, but the constant doesn't happen to be zero. It's different from zero here. And by removing air from down below, I'm going to get into a, an unstable, get this film into an unstable configuration and it will collapse into two portions of spheres. There it is, just about ready to collapse. I'll give it a little assist to save time, but it would go by itself if I left it alone. Well, I broke it. Again, uh, quickly. Well, I broke it. I won't bother to carry out the transformations. There's not much time left on the tape. I'll conclude just by mentioning that one reason for being interested in this subject is that there are correspondences between the shapes of some of these forms and certain natural forms, including the shapes of the membranes of leaves of green plants when grown in the dark. This hasn't been established beyond all shadow of scientific doubt, but the evidence from electron microscopy done so far on these membranes suggests that the two Schwartz surfaces and another surface of which I have a model nearby, which was actually uh, discovered mathematically about a year before it was seen in the electron microscope, uh, pattern very closely the forms of certain uh, leaf membranes when grown in the dark, and that these leaf mem membranes, when illuminated by ordinary light in the course of a couple of hours, deploy long, straight cylindrical tubules, which are said to be photo photosynthetically competent, so the ordinary metabolism by photosynthesis uh, that leads to the growth of the leaf can be carried on. And there's got to be a reason. This subject is in its infancy. Membrane biology is now being pursued very actively, but only a small amount of work has been done on membranes of these particular sorts. There are other examples. I mentioned earlier the shape of soap crystals in high temperature phases, and there are several other examples uh, where the correspondence may be somewhat less exact, but uh, because of the general uh, properties of strength of uh, so-called anti-clastic or saddle surfaces, I think that the investigation of these infinitely connected, or in the case of finite specimens, multiply connected tubularized surfaces of such great smoothness offers many possibilities for gaining insight 
into some matters of experimental science and also possibly architectural structures. show you some specimens of this collection of, of minimal surfaces and a couple of other things just to give you a little more feeling for the variety of shapes without getting involved in any mathematical details at all. Here's our old friend the uh, primitive surface of Schwartz inside an enclosing cubic shell, fundamental region you recall. And here's a different surface in which, which isn't quite as tall. In this surface, the original spherical bubble that we imagine to be centered along the central vertical axis of the cube has had six holes blown out, but only two of them, the top and bottom holes, go to the centers of the faces, and the other four go out to points lying in a horizontal plane on, four, on the four vertical edges of the cube. So this is simply a different way of tubularizing a bubble. And this is a very useful heuristic approach for the derivation of shapes of many of these surfaces. It's now April 1999. The foregoing black and white video was filmed at California Institute of the Arts in 1972. Five years later, I was about to edit that video and also another video I'd made in the meantime in Illinois with a charming fourth grader named Rebecca. But on playback, I found that both tapes had become seriously damaged. I was able to see almost, <clears throat> almost nothing but black mud and scratches. Against all reason, I kept the tapes anyway. Two years ago, most of the segments of both tapes were magically restored by a company in New York. I will shortly show you some models and photos of minimal surfaces, including a few examples not mentioned in the old video. And I'll attempt to fill in some gaps in the California video. First, though, I want to apologize for the poor quality of the soap film experiments in the videos. I underestimated the difficulty of filming in black and white demonstrations of soap films inside a plastic tetrahedron that has distracting tapes visible on its surface. Research on periodic minimal surfaces has truly blossomed <clears throat> in the last 10 to 20 years. Several surfaces whose existence was formerly only conjectured, not proved, have been legitimized. In some cases, by rigorous, by rigorous theoretical analysis, and in others, by discrete numerical analysis, especially by Karcher and Poltier and by Brachy. There have also been some significant scientific and even technological applications of minimal surfaces, which I won't have time to go into. If I were to try to bring this discussion up to date in a balanced way, I would have to refer to the work of an impossibly large number of investigators. Instead, I will make only a few remarks aimed at updating. I would like to acknowledge the inspiration and help I've received, especially from Alfred Wells, Donald Coxeter, 
Peter Pierce, Hans Nietzsche, Hal Robinson, Bob Osserman, and Blaine Lawson. Jumbo Wells' book, Third Dimension in Chemistry, introduced me in the mid-50s to the geometrical core of crystallography. Since the early 60s, I've continued to learn from Donald Coxeter's books and articles on geometry, but I haven't often managed to live up to Coxeter's standards of elegance and rigor. The day after Peter Pierce generously showed me his models of saddle polyhedra in April 1966, I vacuum formed several saddle polygons out of plastic for myself and thereby became acquainted with the Schwartz surfaces P and D. Hans Nietzsche was the first expert on minimal surfaces whom I got to know personally. In 1966, I phoned him out of the blue to ask him if he would please identify two surfaces I had made models of. He replied correctly, as it turned out, that they were probably Schwartz's P and D surfaces, and he steered me towards Schwartz's collected works. From 1968 to 1970, the sculptor and model maker Hal Robinson was my close collaborator. Hal improved to near perfection methods for constructing molds for vacuum formed models of minimal surfaces. In the spring of 1968, Bob Osserman was willing to consider the possibility that the gyroid exists when its existence was still only a conjecture. He then handed the problem over to Blaine Lawson. In the spring of 68, Blaine Lawson not only encouraged me to develop some tentative new ideas of my own, but also provided insights that helped me to recognize that the gyroid is associated to Schwartz's P and D surfaces.